नमस्ते गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम राधा पौडेल एक्टिविस्ट ऑर्थर एंड स्पीकिंग फ्रॉम नेपाल नाउ वी स्पेशली साउथ एशिया हैज बीन स्ट्रगलिंग विद द सेकेंड वेव ऑफ कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडेमिक होप योर फैमिली एंड नियर्स वन आर सेफ together with our like minded friends we have been trying to support to the covid-19 pandemic patients and their families for managing oxygen bed ambulance and other essentials if any of you like to join hands with us please feel free to contact us through the social media or um, our phones today we are live through the facebook page of global south coalition for dignified menstruation it is a global network initiated by radha powdel foundation and working in uh, australia bangladesh indonesia philippines sri lanka north america uganda uk for advocacy training research around dignified menstruation throughout the life cycle today we have a friend all the way from scotland she is dr helen kemp she is the writer editor and advisor on neurodiversity and, and menopause through an attachment aware and trauma informed lens welcome dr helen namaste thank you so much for inviting me If any of you have any questions, queries, please feel free to write in a comment of this Facebook page. My colleagues will pick up and will forward to us. We'll try to attend today, and if not, we will try in next session. Uh, Dr. Helen, let's start our conversation. Why are you so passionate about raising awareness of menopause? Why do global community even in the global north so silence on menopause would you share a little bit about the history of activities around menopause and success and gaps it's a long question but i really wanted to hear from you thank you it it could be a long answer as well um <laughs> i mean my my passion um for raising awareness comes from lived experience i had a particularly challenging surgical menopause at the age of 41 and from speaking to women all over the world and and all over the UK i know my experience is is far from alone and for me there has to be a better way there has to be a different way of dealing with it because whether it's surgical menopause or chemical menopause or biological menopause a different way of dealing with um, it Whether it's you know, women menopause, are falling off a cliff, and if we can prevent that by raising awareness and just by bringing the the, the topic of conversation to, um, out of the shadows, if you like, and and, and making it an everyday topic of conversation, uh, that's the way forward. And looking at, I mean, the successes and the gaps, it's it's. it's a nice position to be in to say that there are there are quite a lot of successes i mean the very fact that you and i are having this conversation from scotland to kathmandu in nepal i mean i think that's just incredible so you know even and the and the work you're doing at the the rada putol foundation is is a huge success looking at it uh looking at it i suppose initially through a um a united kingdom lens there's a huge amount of work that's going on um if we think about i mean wales for example there's there's a big union in wales that's doing a lot of work with their members um in the belindre hospital there are many independent menopause advocates um for example again in wales sarah williams she's she's very strong in championing diversity and inclusion Uh, again if you come back up to scotland of course we've we've got menopause cafe um and looking in the workplace 
Lanarkshire Council and Angus Council, they both introduced menopause in the workplace policies in 2019. So there's a there's a huge driver there, I think, to try and you know get this message and 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 get reasonable adjustments put in place in 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 the workplace. In the Scottish Parliament in 2019, the MSP Christina McKelvey, Minister for Older People and Equality, she led, chaired, uh, chaired a debate on menopause in the Scottish Parliament. Going back down to England, we had Rachel McLean, who again led a debate in the Houses of Parliament. We have to mention Diane Danzibrook with her absolutely amazing Make Menopause Matter campaign. And I, I checked her website this morning and she's had, she's had over 136,000 signatures for her campaign, which is just incredible. And that's just within the United Kingdom. So I, I think there's a huge amount of work going on. I mean, if we look to the States, various uh, authors have started to put out quite a lot of material around menopause. We had Michelle Obama last year mentioning menopause, Oprah Winfrey. Um, and then going back to um, the other side of the world, if you like, the United Emirates, there are a couple of women there. Um, and Marie McQueen, I think her name is, and Donna Haworth, they are championing menopause in, in the, the UAE. So huge strides are being made. The gaps, I think, I think there are many gaps, but, and I think there will always be gaps because as soon as you plug one, I think another one comes up, but it's about, it's about not just talking about it. I think we have to take it perhaps one step further than just talking about it. We have to ensure that somehow it, it either feeds its way down to the, to the grassroots, whether that's a matter of making sure the healthcare professionals are, are um, better trained in, in dealing with menopause. So I, I think it would, be, it would be very easy to look at it from a, a glass half empty, um, but I, I prefer to look at it from, from a glass half full. I, I think that there's a huge amount of work being done and quite often a lot of it just goes un, unrecognized. I think there are many, many advocates beavering away behind the scenes who just don't get any any coverage but that's not to say things aren't going on congratulations we're really proud of you long way to go but there are so many things I have already started and i also part of it uh, while signing the petition um, that petition I, I, I shared through the social media as well. Uh, Dr. Helen, what is the specific difference between uh, biological menopause and surgical menopause? Usually people really get confused or they put the two ideas in the same. Do you explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, certainly. And, and before I do that, actually, I'd, I'd like to say I, I like your reference of, of the term biological because that is, that is really important because I used to, to refer to it as either a natural menopause or surgical menopause. And uh, chatting to um, Heather Karina over in the States, she made the point that, that to call something natural then implies that the opposite is, is not natural. And of course, we are all natural. So um, yeah, really great idea of, of, of referring to it as, as a biological menopause. Many, many factors, I think, feed into the fact that it's just so different. One of them is that it's sudden. Surgical menopause is just, it's sudden by its very nature, removal of both ovaries. You are effectively going overnight into a biological process that would have happened over perhaps 10 or 15 years. And I think whilst there may be some residual estrogen left, I think perhaps in, in, in the fatty parts of the body that, that will gradually taper off, you are effectively going cold turkey as regards a hormone that your body has been used to operating on since, since puberty. And I think, I mean, I, I often use the word brutal when talking about a surgical menopause. And I know that's quite an emotive word, but 
it is it is a shock to the body and if you consider if it occurs as, a, as perhaps part of either um, preventative or an actual treatment for cancer it's happening in younger women so they're living a far greater proportion of their lives without hormones and again if they're younger you're going to have issues of perhaps they might not have had the opportunity to have children so you're having psychological impact as well so it's, it's not just I suppose all of the physical symptoms of, of menopause which which hit typically quite hard and quite sudden so yes the, the, the hot sweats and the night flushes um, they can or oh, the other way around isn't it it's hot flushes and night sweats it's not just those. I mean, yes, they can be debilitating, but it's the psychological impact. It's the low mood. It's the knock on confidence, low self-esteem, depression for many women. And I think to be faced with those perhaps 35, 40, when you're looking to start a family, perhaps you might be reaching the peak of your career. Maybe you have teenage children or elderly parents. And it just creates this perfect storm. So it's, it's that for me would be where the major differences are. The very fact that it's just so sudden and it's, it's not a, a gradual uh, tapering away where the body has chance to acclimatize. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, last week, uh, many of my friends were working on uh, gender-based violence in humanitarian setting, they never talk about the menstruation and they started to experience the um, um, pre-menopausal symptom and they started to um, talk over the that um, Facebook site. So um, even the educated, uh, even the activist um, friends are not mentally prepared for that. They are not educated about the menopause, no matter whether it is um, surgical or not. Uh, you have already um, explained a little bit, but I really wanted to know more so our colleagues will understand about it. Why um, uh, the dignified menopause is a concern of human rights and how? Would you explain a little bit with the perspective of the human rights framework? Yeah, I mean, I, I, in the same way that um, dignified menstruation is, I think dignified menopause is as well, because I look at, I look at it as a continuum. And if you think about somebody's right to live a safe existence, to basic health and hygiene if we're not providing the environment or the circumstances to facilitate a lived existence where there's a quality of life I think that is an issue that that affects our human rights and I mean I was looking at the um, the UN women's uh, website today and it's quite interesting to see that there are quite a few mentions of menstruation, but absolutely nothing on menopause. And it's almost as if this women are seen perhaps as or seen only to be productive during their reproductive age, and then they hit menopause. And it's as if nobody's interested at all. And, you know, whilst we're talking about it, is it being spoken about elsewhere? I think that, that that that's sort of where I'm coming from. And it, it's also that the flip side of it is if, if we're saying it's 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 a it's a basic human right to, to, to have a dignified menopause. How and who delivers that? I think that's that's a question that I don't have the answer for. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a really very huge subject. 
we um, can link with the human right in many ways. Mm. If we talk about the perspective of the uh, health or education or the environment, there are many ways we can link with the human right and as well as the constitutional right of the country. Mm. Mm. Um, I want to know more about um, um, why the people are still not speaking about the um, surgical menopause. Or let me um, tell another way. You have very spe specifically highlighted menopause as a result of surgery. Do you think the surgical menopause is any harder than chemical or natural menopause? With the example, so our colleagues uh, will get more um, benefit uh, uh, to understand the essence of the um, surgical menopause. Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer because it's hard to quantify suffering, if you like. I think that there's no hierarchy to suffering. And I think to, to claim it's perhaps harder or not as hard as any other type of menopause perhaps does a disservice to certain groups. I think I, I, I now usually just say it's different. It's different. Um, for some women, it will be easier. For some women, they say it's, 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 not, as, it's not as easy given that I didn't have a natural menopause or a biological menopause, I suppose it's very hard for me to, to, to compare, isn't it, to say, well, it was, it was harder or easier because I might have been one of the 25% of women who, as, as, as you know, stats show, just sailed through the menopause. But it's different in as much as Again, with the, with the age, if you're looking at it, I mean, I'm, I was 41 when I went through mine and there are so many things going on at that time of life. Menopause was not on my radar screen. And the surgery itself was not the end of my issues, whether they were gynecological or not. The surgical menopause put a stop to some of my gynecological issues because I had endometriosis and you know as you know I, I still I will still have that because it's a surge, um, hysterectomy and removal of ovaries it, it's not a cure for endometriosis so surgical menopause in one sense it might deal with quite a lot of problems but it doesn't deal with all of them and it also I think potentially creates other problems which is where I suppose some women will say, well, it's harder than, than another type of menopause. I think everybody's experiences are valid and welcome. And I think in a compassionate world, there's, there's room for everyone, isn't there? And everybody's experiences. Um, but if you look at the knock-on effects as regards perhaps the pelvic floor and prolapse, there's, there's, especially if you have the uterus removed as well, that there's, there's, uh, you have a higher risk of a prolapse later on in life after surgery. So you've got that implication. Um, sexual dysfunction, you know, again, if you're in your late 30s, early 40s, vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, they are a really significant problem. And particularly if you're in a relationship and if you can't, I, I know there are, the, the, there are various topical estrogens that are not systemic that can help with vaginal dryness, dryness but they are not necessarily available. So I think it, it, it can um, destroy and it can break up marriages and relationships. So as I say, I always say surgical menopause, it's just a different beast. And in the same way that chemical menopause can be extremely challenging for women who go down that route um, for whatever reason, it's it's just different and i think it's it's helpful to raise awareness of that fact just because then i think you can then foster understanding and you can you can best you're better able to get help if you know symptoms you're dealing with yeah. 
thank you. It's, it's really so, uh, some extent is scary, some extent is uh, exciting. Uh, my two sisters also had gone through the surgical menopause and later when they um, experienced the um, different illnesses, they said, oh, we should not do the um, surgery because we, we don't have any relief. We are living with the additional layer of suffering. That was the um, experience from, uh, uh, from my sisters. And I'm really, um, uh, feel myself uh, so um, I'm not ready for for my surgical menopause. Doctor asked me for the surgery because of um, my fibroiditis, and still I'm not ready um, because um, of the same. So it is not easy, and many things our surgeons don't know. Many things we don't know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what would be your suggestion? The menstruators like me who are uh, going to have the surgical menopause very soon? I think find out as much as you possibly can before. Um, that is really, really important and, and make sure it's an informed choice. And I mean, I, I don't know that the, the level of information that women in Nepal will, will leave hospital with. Um, I mean, certainly I left hospital with just two pieces of, of of advice or information or instructions, if you like. And they were not to lift anything heavier than a kettle full of water for six weeks and not to have sex for six weeks. And those were the only two pieces of information that, that I left hospital with. And again, a lot of the women I talked to, I mean, it's interesting that both of those frames of reference, one is the kitchen and one is the bedroom. Whereas there's, a great deal more going on in a woman's life other than those two aspects but I mean that aside um, be prepared I think it's about making sure you're prepared and getting your body prepared for it getting your home prepared for it and also preparing those around you because we're typically told that women will heal or be healed and ready to go back to work or back to their normal lives within six to eight weeks and that rarely happens, certainly from you know, the women that I've spoken to. And that wasn't the case for me. I wasn't back to work until six to eight months after surgery. And it's, yes, I suppose as far as the surgeon is concerned, the internal healing is okay. But there's an awful lot more going on and, and muscles if you've had an open abdominal incision, those muscles take time to, to heal and strengthen and knit together. So it's, it's be prepared and make sure it's, it's, it's an informed choice to have the surgery and just be aware that it's not necessarily just the one golden solution that you will have the surgery and you will leave and you will be absolutely fine. You may well be because it, it happens, but it's, it's about being prepared for the instances when, when they don't happen. And just trying to be yeah, up prepare those that you live with and also your home environment to, to, so that you can heal as best as you possibly can. Okay, very emotional one. Thank you so much. Uh, in this connection, what would be the role of the partner or husband or the children um, or family members? Uh, would you um, say a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, I think if, I mean, if we consider how much of a shock the surgery tends to be for, for, for the women themselves, I think it can be completely baffling for those that we, we live and, and share our lives with because they see us come out of hospital and they expect us to be perhaps positive because we've had the surgery and that's quite a major hurdle we've got so much going on for us in our own minds that I think it can be very difficult for us to be positive. We've got the, the, the loss of hormones, our moods are all over the place. We've probably got the hot flushes and the night sweats. And if we're confused, I think that they're, they're, they're far more confused because 
in some respects, we are, or if I speak for myself, I was not the same person after surgery as I was before in many regards. And again, that came as a complete shock to me. So it's, it's about ensuring that they know that we're going to need time, we're going to need empathy and patience and understanding because it's, it's, it's just a really perplexing time. And also an awareness that it, it's not going to have, recovery will not happen overnight. We may not even be back to who we were, were before surgery because having organs removed is, is quite, a major, quite a major operation. So I think, I mean, there's a really great book. It's, it's, it's just on menopause as such. Um, Ruth Devlin, I think it's uh, Let's Talk Menopause Men or something along, along those lines. But that's a really great book just as a primer so that men know what to expect as regards the menopause. But um, as it, it's, it's really just, I think you have to prepare them so that they, they, know, they know that we're not going to be really firing on all cylinders for a while. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really really touched with the with each all. In this connection, what would be your suggestion regards to the role of the um, uh, policymakers at workplace and the policymaker at the, at the at the country level? I mean, the policy of the Ministry of Health or the government. What would be the role? What would be your suggestions to address the Mm, surgical menopause um, in, in, in a policy framework at the organization level is the government level. I mean, I think at, at a really, really basic level, it would be really helpful if the patient information leaflets were just updated and revised because when the woman leaves hospital, that is a prime opportunity to ensure that they leave with, with, with adequate and appropriate information. So instead of just having those two you know, um, refrain from sex and, and not lift the, the, the kettle, just have a couple of paragraphs in there about perhaps you up a pelvic floor, make sure you do your pelvic floor exercises. This may impact your mood. You may have, to, you know, it will probably impact your sleep. I think if we can feed the information in when women leave hospital, that would help. As, I mean, as regards the broader spectrum continuing to have the conversations and I mean the fact that menopause is being taught uh, and this was as a result of Diane Danzybrook's campaign the fact that menopause is being taught in secondary schools in England I'm not aware that it is in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland so that needs to change as well or I think that would be very helpful if that were to change and with a with a very specified framework. I think if medics, if medics were aware of, of, of the sort of the subtle nuances that, that come with surgical menopause, I think that would help. Yeah, I do totally agree. Mm. How do you see the relationship between the menarche and menopause? Should we work um, separately or simultaneously how and when or why i mean what is the link with the menopause or before the menopause with the menarche or before the menarche i'm trying to see the surgical menopause or digni dignified menopause throughout the life cycle approach how do you see the connection it's a continuum i, I see it as a continuum and I, I i think i've heard you talk about um womb to tomb i think it's about um ensuring that 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 everyone has the best possible experience whether it's puberty childbirth child care child rearing or menopause and how we do that, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I was, again, I was looking at the, the, the UN Women's um, website earlier today, and there was quite a bit on there 
with respect to menstruation, but I think I found one reference to menopause. And I think that's potentially a missed opportunity or, or that's an opportunity, if you like, to address that. Because if you get somebody, I don't know um, whether it's, 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 it's an ambassador or somebody, a figurehead in UN Women who is not the word. Um, I was going to say a figurehead, but but who champions the menopause? I think that would make a very very powerful statement, and it would link up menstruation and menopause because they are they are lit they are just it's it's i suppose it's continuous spectrum but if you're not looking after one you're not looking after the other and and why not just look after both of them i think as i say it's it's a missed opportunity um yeah yeah and and what i mean i i often i mean we've spoken before about what drives it and I think the fact that nobody's speaking about it doesn't mean to say there's not a problem. I think that's that's a big thing um, because absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And if if we're not talking about it, then I think there can be the assumption that it's not a problem. So nothing is done, and nobody talks about it. And you know, around and around we go. In, in, in a vicious cycle and I think it's driven by shame and it just takes more and more of us I think to, to step forward to step into that that I suppose really uncomfortable vulnerable space to have the difficult conversations to just keep driving the agenda forward because it's um I mean from 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 my point of view it it was too easy to remain silent and every single one of us who speaks out I mean there was a, a Channel 4 documentary last night with Davina McCall on all around menopause and um, fantastic lady who went through a menopause at 14 Hayley Kochman she's 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 she put herself out there and has spoken about her experiences and I think that's what we need. We just need more of us to come forward and speak about them. The only way to drive out shame, I think, shame and stigma. Uh, what I found from the literature, people do not like to talk about surgical menopause. Mm, they, they feel more pressure, pressure from the family members, from the Mm, friends and also they have a very deep level of emotional pressure from the partner so that is why they don't like to share with anyone and in many cultures the menarche or first menstruation is a kind of celebration mm -hmm. despite having the silence or ignorance, there is some room for celebration or there is some room for hope that she would be a mother in future. She would reproduce the children. This is how people indirectly, the community keep accepting the minarchy. But the other side of the coin, people are not ready to accept the menopause. And in the meantime, the menstruator in many cultures, menstruators, they like to have the menopause as early as possible because they wanted to get rid of from the so many restriction or limitation. Um, they wanted to get rid of from that kind of discrimination. But unfortunately, they are not prepared about the um, uh, different kind of symptoms or illnesses or suffering. Uh, from the um, uh, menopause, uh, no matter whether it is surgical or not. So mm -hmm. this is how I see the significant link um, 
of the menopause throughout the life cycle. And as you shared earlier, if we link with our educational program since uh, childhood is it, it, a um, part of the life uh, and it would be more easier because language construct the mindset and, and then mindset construct the behavior. And everyone talk about the dignified menopause, menopause, surgical menopause, it is more easier. Yep. So this is how we, we see the menopause overall and the surgical menopause is, is, is really, really important uh, in many ways. We cannot define um, this is the characters of the surgical menopause or chemical menopause. We don't know. Each menstruator has a unique character, unique manifestation for this kind of um, phenomenon. So it's, it's really important. Uh, would you share a little bit about the the book which was recently launched, uh, Surgical Menopause? So yeah. our audience will reach out uh, more. And I have already gone through it, and it's just really um, hard to warm me. I love it. Thank you, Dale. It was, I mean, it was a labor of love, actually. It, it, it was an idea last year to, to bring women together, 12 women together, so that they could all share their experiences because they're all subtly different. They had the surgeries for different reasons. Some have, have absolutely flourished after surgery. Some have found it a little bit tricky. And then there's me, you know, who I, I struggled initially. And, and after a while, I, I started to find my feet. And it was just about giving everybody a voice so that they could share their experiences. Because I think we heal when our stories are, are told in safe places. And I know how therapeutic writing can be for myself. And so it was, it was just very, very important to, to let women have their voice. And also, I mean, we, we hear from, um, we have a GP and a menopause specialist who, who gives her opinion and her input, Dr. Jane Davis. We have a really fantastic nurse practitioner, Hazel Hayden, who, who gives her input as well. And also we, we hear from, from experts in, I suppose we call them complementary fields, which, which give some indications or, or, or some ideas about what to do perhaps if you can't or don't want to go down the HRT route. So there's something in there about Qigong, about exercise, about just being a bit kinder to yourself. We have somebody touch on pelvic floor exercises. It, it, it was just, I wanted it to be, I, I, it's, it's a little book about a big change because I wanted it to be relatively easily digestible. I wanted it to be approachable just so that and I didn't want it to scare women or put women off because, you know, surgical menopause is, is, is not the worst thing in the world. It, it can be really, really great with the right support and, and the right help. So that, that was my motivation for, for putting it out there. Yeah, thank you so much. Friends, this book is very practical, very simple. Anyone can understand very easily. Uh, with the simple lang uh, English language. Um, and if any of you like to translate in your local language, please feel free to contact with Dr. Helen. And on behalf of Radhapur Foundation, we just decided to translate into Nepali. And we are so excited. Thank you very much for this approval. We also like to um, know a little bit more about the uh, menopause cafe. How could we bring all kinds of friends on the same board, no matter where we are. Could you repeat that? I didn't quite quite get the gist of it. Uh, I want to listen a little bit more about the Menopause Cafe, your champion. So the friends who are interested on uh, menopause, uh, they will join no matter where they are. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, 
I'm with you. Yes. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Menopause Cafe um, started in 2017 by Rachel Weiss in, in Perth, Scotland, and we became a charity in 2018. And it's it's quite literally, we create spaces for conversations about menopause, whether that's um, before COVID, it would have been in coffee shops, or perhaps just in a park. Whereas with COVID, we, we rolled them out online. And the menopause cafe experience is just, it's a safe, confidential space to have a conversation about menopause. Any gender, any age, we've had a nine month old baby attend, we've had an 84 year old woman attend. In its there are no speakers. We don't promote any particular products. We don't promote any outcomes. It's not as such an information giving exercise. It's just bringing the topic out into, into the public domain in, in the same way that um, it was based on the death cafe movements started by John Underwood, where again, I mean, a death is, is, is a topic that's not really spoken about. And it just provides a platform in, in a yep, respectful environment over tea and, and cake, because I think tea and cake make make most things better. And you know, we've 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 arranged there's been over 500 individual cafes over the last it's nearly four years now. And four or five thousand people have have attended in total. And it's 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 just about helping to break a taboo. I think, and um, you can see at the moment, I mean, it, it's, I think society is gradually changing. The culture is gradually changing. Uh, certainly as, as far as the UK is concerned, you can't move at the moment for, for something menopause related, which, which is good because, you know, as, as you were saying, it's, it's, if you can get it into the conversation, if you can get it into the printed written word, then, and, and, and through po popular culture as well, because that's a way to make to make change, isn't it? To really to embed it in. Um, so yeah, and we just we we had the menopause festival this year, which that that's about it's about fun, it's about information, it, it's about empowering as well. Because I think women in particular, I I think our, our confidence can take a big knock around menopause, and it's just about letting other women know that they're not alone, they're not going mad, because I think that's, you know, that's, that, that can be an issue with the psychological impact. And it's, it's just a shared space. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in um, Global South Coalition for Dignified Menstruation, we strongly um, believe the role of the boys and men for making menstruation dignified. So do you share or do you suggest the role of the boys and men to make menopause dignified? Yeah, yeah, it, it's getting men and actually as, as we try and encourage them to come along to our events and we have about it's about one one to two percent male because whether they are husbands or perhaps nephews or line managers they will invariably know someone who is going through the menopause and if it's in a workplace, perhaps a male manager might be completely confused about what's happening to perhaps a member of his staff because maybe she's she's getting, you know, if she's not sleeping, she she could well be tired, brain fog, maybe she's getting a bit anxious and a bit a bit irritable. It's very difficult to make adjustments if you don't understand what the driving force is behind it. So I I think it's extremely important that that the men and the boys as well because. If your mother's going through the menopause, if she's having a hard time, it, it's it's not always easy on the children. So it, I think it's extremely important that they are they are part of the conversation. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. They are the part of the conversation. Yeah. And it's boys and men have to acknowledge the essence of the menstruation and their presence in this universe. This is how we believe. And also like to know about the religious perspective uh, regards to the menopause. Usually, while we talk about the menstruation or dignified menstruation, people are so happy. They spellbound while listening the lectures. And later they said, oh, it's a matter of the religion. It's, it's my culture. And my, my grand, um, parents don't allow. I don't like to hurt them. That kind of conversation keeps keeps coming from the perspective of the culture and religion. Do you find any connection or perspective from the religion or culture while we talk about the menopause or not? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting. Um, and uh, I've recently noticed there are some um, groups on, I think it's either Twitter or Instagram, that are looking at um, menopause from, from a Black and Asian and ethnic communities stance. Because I think there are quite a lot of studies. I think it's with fibroids that uh, particular um, ethnic groups have harder times with various gynecological issues. I I think some societies, whether it's religious based or not, are more closed off to any type of. Um, how to put it? Um, yeah, I suppose female, female um, based topic. But I think it, no, menopause, I, it just it affects everyone. And I think there's, there's I personally don't see any issue with religion. But that may just be my, my narrow lens. Um. Last time when we were um, having conversation with Dr. Camilla again in, from the Scotland, she was explaining that the menstruation is the politics and um, the election, which was just happening in last um, second May, that um, would um, define the uh, menstrual movement in Scotland. So in this connection, do you see any um, role from the political point of view or how do you see the uh, dignified menopause uh, is a political concern? I think anything that that affects 51% of the population has to, has to have a, a, a political aspect to it. It comes back to human rights, doesn't it? I think it's 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 a human right issue. It's a quality of life issue, um, perhaps rather than a gendered issue. And I mean, if if I look at some of the, the 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 people coming into politics now, and some of the politicians, they are they are younger, and thank goodness they are female. Which means we have a much better opportunity to have our voice heard when we have that that demographic in in positions of power and i mean from a, from a, either a period positivity or a dignified period or dignified menstruation the the the, the younger generation of i think are far more vociferous about standing up for what they perceive to be uh, their rights and i think yeah they're far more vociferous and they're not willing to put up with perhaps what m my generation or somebody of my generation might have been. They refuse to be held back by the fact that they menstruate or they don't menstruate. So I, I think, I think yes, it is, it is a political issue in as much as it's a human issue. And I think it, it's, it's really hard to sort of disentangle those, isn't it? Yeah. But I mean, if you look at what, what's, as I say, with the Scottish Parliament having a debate in 2019, I mean, I think that alone is is it just sends a, a positive signal um, that it's 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 something that needs to be taken seriously. Yeah, absolutely. You keep referring the one statement, missing the opportunity. I love that statement. Why? 
did the global stakeholders, including UN, keep missing this opportunity? How do you think about that? I think it's some of it is to do with um, it's it, the squeaky wheel gets oil, doesn't it? It's the whole time we are silent and we are not speaking about these things. It's it just becomes easy to ignore it. And it's 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 also finding a language for it, I think, as well, because and a language that is palatable. And, and what I mean by that is, I think it's very easy to shock. It's very easy to use graphic words to, and, and, and to make a point. But I think that shocks, but then that doesn't necessarily engage. And yes, we need to get people on our side and, 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 and build allies and, and relationships. And I think we, yeah, we can only do that by being willing to to a have difficult conversations, b keep having them, and just invite people around the table, whether they want to be there or not, keep inviting them, and just I think it's about making sure we are as inclusive as possible, because then it we can make it harder for the opportunities to be missed, because if we're always there and we always we always have a voice at the table and if if we're not not at the table then we just find another way to to make our voice heard but i think it's it's just keep chipping away and making it very difficult for people to ignore us because eventually our voices will, will be heard totally agree it's, it's, a, it's a really my heart is getting heavy by considering the entire movement on human right development feminism or sexual reproductive health right or menstrual hygiene management there are so many movements has been taking place for decades and decades and still we are not talking about the reason of our existence. Sometimes I'm so angry, sometimes frustrated, sometimes just smiling. So in this connection, what would be your stake or the suggestions to the friends who are intensively engaged for sexual and reproductive rights and menstrual movement? How could we bring them on the same board to work on dignified menstruation throughout the life cycle? I, I think you must have read my mind um, because I, I I think it would it it a summit. I think a summit would actually help that that because now we 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 know we can work virtually. Geographical location is no longer. A factor to prevent somebody being part of a meeting. I think it's getting all the stakeholders together and making sure we have those around the table that are there because they want change. Whether whether it's it's as I say going back to the UN, whether it's a, a, a point of getting somebody in the UN who's prepared to stand up and become an ambassador for. Yep, I would actually say. Um, female hormonal health, because then that encompasses everything, doesn't it? It encompasses, uh, using your term, from, from womb to tomb. You, you remind me the International Workshop, uh, which we had uh, made together last year uh, during the International Dignified Mrs. Day. December 8, 19. You also one of the speaker of that workshop. Uh, let's plan together to organize the summit on dignified menopause. Our, our menopause is a large, is a follow-up um, incoming December 8. Mm -hmm. We can do the virtual. Let's plan on it after this uh, conversation. And it's, it's really, really important to educate uh, about the 
urgency of yeah. dignified menopause. Yeah, absolutely. Because and, dig yeah. dignified menstruation it's not is their mistake, but somehow they, they miss out the conversation. I think it could be the silence, the ignorance, the stigma or taboos, and that associates with the uh, menopause, that is sort of the patriarchy system, what we have been struggling. We keep saying patriarchy, patriarchy, but we, we are not really um, uh, analyze which is the key determinant or key factor to, to create uh, that kind of uh, practice we have been struggling right now. Yeah. So let's plan for it. It's a really, really good idea. We are about to close. We have limited time. Our friends, um, those who are watching, um, please uh, um, keep following us uh, through our web, um, social media and website. Uh, uh, we have been active in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also YouTube. We have been organizing the programs uh, for supporting COVID patients, uh, especially in Nepal, for arranging bed, ambulance service, oxygen. And um, uh, there is a link for donation, go fund for me, and uh, bank details and PayPal. Um, from any means, you can transfer your donation. And if you um, have any materials, especially the pulse oximeter, um, oxygen concentrator, if you have any connection through the flights from Malaysia and China. Right now we have very limited flights uh, because of the COVID, everything is stopped. But for the uh, medical purpose, there are some flights are open. So if any of you like to join the hand, please let us know and we will um, uh, explore the possibilities. How could we bring these kind of things by contacting with the government and ambassadors in different countries? Um, and we are really in a dire need uh, for it. Um, before going, uh, Helen, um, um, I really like to thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, um, the time is really short. I always feel like um, this. Uh, when we engage in a conversation, we are so passionate and so many things we don't touch. And suddenly I feel, oh, we have to do the research, we have to do the campaign, we have to engage the um, uh, stakeholders from the UN, from the INGOs, from the um, grassroots level organization. And it's, it's really missing that kind of feeling and hunger always comes up. And um, by the time the time is over, uh, uh, no matter where we are, we will we, we'll keep continuing. Uh, no matter what kind of um, uh, disaster or COVID, keep coming and uh, trying to pull out, uh, pulling us backward, but we, we will not give up at all. And so um, we will be continuing. And the, um, I have a strong feeling that the dignified menopause is still very important in the human trend setting as well. Um, for the COVID patient, um, the doctors and nurses have been giving so many medicines like steroids, the antibiotics, and they, they are living in a three weeks in, in ICU in ventilators and no one think about their hormones, no one think about their um, um, menopausal symptoms. And, and that is why it is, it is very important and it is, it is a kind of cross-cutting issues and we have to go beyond the gender lens. Gender lens is not enough to understand, to recognize the needs of the menstruators throughout the life cycle. So before um, saying goodbye, we have two minutes. Um, Helen, uh, um, would you share your um, last uh, thought or message to our friends uh, now and future? I mean, firstly, I, I, I want to say thank you to you actually for, for inviting me to come and talk about this and and also thank you for all the work you do tirelessly because you beaver away behind the scenes so thank you Rata. Um, I mean as regards menopause as a whole I think it's 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 about keeping the conversations going it's about raising awareness where possible advocating for ourselves it's about self-management and it's it's about being proactive where we possibly can because of knowledge is power. It really is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger. Thank you.